three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Studio Life. My name is Mark, and it's my pleasure to host this wonderful show with my great friend today, Mike Whitehead. Now, Mike and I have gone back years. We we love talking technology. We're kind of geeks in the business. But Mike's been this radio dude who's kind of in transition. We're going from radio to global, from small market, medium market, large market, to everybody market throughout the entire universe. So today, it is my great pleasure to hang out with my friend, Mike. So, Mike, how are you today? Mark, great to see you. I'm doing well. You know, I barely knew you were there. I, well, I like hiding behind signs. Well, the best way, it's great promotion. That's right. And it, <laughs> it also simplifies the graphic process. It sure does. <laughs> we don't have to have an intro of all the graphic feeds and the scroll. That's right. We don't even, we don't <laughs> even need another graphic. All we have to do is like just rip it down from in front of you and we're good to go. I like it. It works well. So how are things? Things are going very well. It's very good out there in the industry right now and I see you're doing well here in the industry. Yeah. I mean, we love being a part of everything. And one of the things we like being a part of are these podcasts, these radio shows, things like that. Things you have a whole lot of experience in. That's correct. So tell me, you come from the radio space. What is the radio space? What was it? What was it for you? Boathouse TV? Well, it's interesting. I came off. I started in TV. I came off TV from Fox Sports <clears throat> and then Salem Communications in San Diego, KCBQ, great station down there, 50,000 watts, uh, picked up my, ch my show. And it was the Boathouse radio show, all about boating, anything to do with water. And what's nice with 50,000 watts, of course, we have a great uh, reach on the broadcast signal. So with that, then I built a boating show and it became the number one boating show in the nation. Very nice. Now, tell me a little bit of the process in radio. When you think radio, you think of somebody's out there with some microphone and they're talking into it. And you don't really think about the business of radio, but but how does it support itself? How, like, what made it worthwhile for you? There's a hole behind the scene, just like on the TV side. You just don't have the editing like you do with TV because I was live. So everybody thought you'd walk out, flip on the switch, talk for an hour or so, turn off the switch, and you're done. But that's where most people then leave the business. They don't understand the background to it. Before your show even starts, you've got to design the show. You've got to design the marketing, the advertising, and you have to get sponsors on board and advertisers. And that's what everybody forgets. There's a whole network behind the scenes that you don't see of people that actually might be working for you or you're consulting with or bringing them on board to help you with items. A lot of interns love to help out, new people coming into the business, love to learn how it works. So when you first start a show or even in a show, you have to have the forefront. And the forefront would be setting up the show. What's the content? Who's going to handle the content? Who's going to handle the production? Who's going to handle the uh, advertisers, the sponsors? Then when the show's over for that, that segment of time, well, then you have the follow-up. Everyone forgets there's a huge follow-up. Now go out and how'd the show do? What do you need to do? You need to listen to the show. You need to uh, uh, design the new show. You need to talk to the advertisers. How they get perceived? Do their sales go up? And things of that nature. So it, it's a big process. It's just not, hey, I've got an hour show. I'm going to flip on talk for an hour, flip it off. The board operator's happy, sounded great. The station's happy because it's a live show on a weekend and it's going well. And of course, now you, you, everyone can listen around the world over the internet. So now what do you do? And that, that's the big key. And that's where the details are, as you know. So basically what you're saying is radio is harder than just talking. Absolutely. And it, but if you love it, it's not hard. It's just part of the process. So let's convert because really that's what we're trying to do. We're talking, the studio life is all about the future. Right. Right. I mean, and we respect the past. We look to the future. When people walk in here and we talk podcasts, a lot of the time, the thought is that it's as simple as turning on a mic, sitting down in front, you know, whether, you, whether it's video or just audio, because to me, the word podcast doesn't really mean anything. It's really just a shorthand for doing something exactly. that you're going <laughs> where you're producing your own content. <laughs> but one way or another, most of the podcasts that come through 
think it's that easy. Well, I'll just come in, I'll record a few episodes, I'll get them posted. And of course, eventually things will happen. So it, it, it almost appears as if the, the radio lesson has not transferred to the global to the global universe. And I want to talk about that. In radio, you didn't have a choice but to be in business. Like, what was the model? Right. How did you get yourself on air in the first place? Well, when, like I said, when I came off the TV side, I go, uh, I'm going to go to radio. And people are saying, Mike, go to radio. I've been guest uh, on a many radio shows before that, talking about my TV side and other things I was doing. And so it was a very nice <clears throat> transition to transition to the radio side. But to get there, before I even went there, I went out and I created a show. It's very easy at the start to start a show. For, as for what I mean by content. Because you're excited, everyone's enthusiastic, they wanna do it, they wanna do it. Well now do it for 15 years. What's that second year show gonna be about on that? What's this gonna be about? The, the enthusiasm might dry up, people don't have the content. They had enough content maybe for half a dozen shows, but what happens after that? So you have to have that focus, you gotta have that drive. And if you really love what you're talking about, that's very easy to do for a good host, someone that knows what they're doing, some a professional field, or your support staff to help you get the content you need. But then you've got to keep everyone else excited. What do you do with your sponsors? Well, I would go out to boat shows and set up a booth and broadcast right from the boat shows. Now the sponsors can come over, they can be on the air. Sometimes we'd have a TV crew out there that'd be filming it for the local news. They get on the news, they get more uh, more uh, exposure that way. So you've got to think of it all as one big picture. You can't take a, a pie and just take a slice. The broadcast, <clears throat> advertising, the board ops got to be involved. You've got to have the station involved. You've got to have your advertisers involved. And that's what's yeah. really important. But we're, we're kind of still missing missing my, my question, which is the studio wants something in exchange for doing this. The Correct. radio station only has so many slots Correct. available. So you have to essentially bribe them to let you on air. They're going to charge you some money. So that deal is, you know, g right. give me an example of what that deal might right. look like. Right. There's, there's two ways to do it. One way is you pitch it to the station. The station owns a show. The station tells you what to do, and they give you a check at the end of the day. The other way that, that I, I went in with and a lot of other big radio shows do is you go in the station and negotiate the cost for that time slot. And you can do this at one station. You can do it simultaneously at many stations. And so you'll go to the station and go, hey, for uh, time slot A, at this time of day, for this many hours, I'm going to give you $1,000, $2,000, whatever you negotiate. Then you have your advertisers come in and then backfill that. So the advertiser where you'll make you'll make your money basically for your, bed and, uh, your uh, bread and butter. However, you have speaking engagements that come out of that that can help. You also have, uh, uh, like I mentioned, boat shows that'll pay you to go there and do special events. So there's other ways to bring the revenue stream into your show to make it worthwhile to where you're glad to write the station that check at the end of the month because you've made a profit out of it. Yeah, I mean, many radio stations make no money except for the fact that it promotes other revenue channels that the, that the host is able to take advantage of. Correct. Or other businesses that the host may be benefiting uh, or benefiting from. Uh, so the radio station essentially would get would charge you by the hour. That's correct. By the, Depend, by the depends what 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 slot you you may be. Some do half hours, hour, three hours, right. depending what you you negotiate and what's how big a show you have to yep. slot it out. A lot of people jump in right away, and this is where you you'll see a show splash, and it'll hit the it'll be great, and it'll do well, and then six months from now or a year from now you don't hear it. They'll jump in and grab a three-hour slot, again, having enthusiasm going, I can do this, I can do this. By the sixth week, you know, they got dead air. And they, their sponsors have fallen off because the revenue stream's not coming in. So you don't want to jump in, if, especially if you're just starting out, you don't want to jump in more than you can chew. You want to make sure maybe start a little smaller, and then as the show grows, then expand, expand your time slot. You also be very careful who's in front of you and who's behind you. I was very lucky that my show was so popular, the uh, station then and the stations out there would start picking who was behind me and, and who, was, who I was leading into. Because you don't want just a, a talking commercial 
like we have there, leading you into your show because you have no followers. And so a lot of times in my show then, before me, they would, they would uh, put a show and it had listeners. So it would follow into my show, then come out of my show, typically be a new show that my listeners then would follow into them. And then outside those shows, it would fall back to some of the, right. the advertising shows. And some of the radio stations will take a cut of the sponsor dollars as well. Yeah. You, can, you can work that out as well. We had that. If the station sh uh, sold the spot, then we would divvy that up and split that out as well. I had a great advertising uh, a person out there that was selling the spots for me, so I didn't have to worry too much. Uh, I like keeping advertising and content separate. Yeah, it's always a good strategy yes. if you if you could pull it off. Yes, being that I, I come from a columnist in the newspaper, I, I knew well to make sure that uh, my content and whatever advertisers they put around me, they usually put me right before the sports section because that is the most read section of the newspaper. So I would lead in the sports section, and then they would place ads around my column. But I stayed yeah. separate of that. Now, there are a couple of important revenue channels. Now, one of the things that makes this important, and for you out there, one of the things that makes this important, is that we don't just do it for any one reason. We, when we look at why we build a show, why we build a podcast, why we build anything, it is often with the attention to the detail with respect to how the money's coming back. So, for instance, a lawyer who does a show may actually be trying to gain their own clients. So it may look like a radio show, which is publicly informative. Exactly. But in fact, it's one one hour, two hour, four hour advertising campaign to say, if you're looking for a lawyer, call me. If you're talking about estate planning, for instance, and you have a lawyer who does nothing but talk about estate planning on Saturday mornings, all they need is one client to pay for that time slot. Two clients and, and they're going on vacation, three clients and they're buying a house. That's and, exactly right. And so it doesn't take a whole lot. And then the other potential model, which I wanted to throw out there, is this affiliate model, which says you have a non-sponsor sponsor. And this is common with uh, a lot of website hosts. It's one of the reasons why you go on YouTube and you see website host after website host sponsoring shows. It's not because they're sponsors. It's because they have generous affiliate packages. See, and that's the key as, as the Internet evolves and grows there's all these new opportunities for sponsorship that sponsorship didn't exist when i started out in radio it wasn't there i mean the internet wasn't as robust i mean we we're excited that our airways finally got on an internet channel that someone in australia could hear listen to my show so these new channels with revenue streams that you're you're mentioning and looking at there's going to be more down the road the trick is is for someone to stay up with it and try and leapfrog into the next big thing. That's why you want to try. You want to get your tentacles out there. And you want to, well, maybe this will work. Let's give it a try. That's right. So it's possible to say to somebody, like let's say a restaurant, a local restaurant, to say to that restaurant, hey, listen, we want you to sponsor the show. And we need $1,000. And they're going to say, no, I don't want to sponsor a show. I don't know if you have listeners or watchers or or an audience. I, I don't even know if that audience is paying enough attention in order to, to, to even listen to that spot. And so the way the negotiation can go is to say, you know what, don't give me the thousand dollars. But if I'm able to promote your restaurant, you'll give me 5% or 10% of the, of the tickets. Exactly Basically right. building an affiliate program, even with programs that are, that are grassroots, businesses that are, have local <clears throat> presence. Uh, obviously it helps if it's software, if it's or if it's web based where the cost of goods is close to zero where they can give you 50 percent for whatever that number is but even at a local restaurant if they're able to increase their business because of that presence it's possible you can get sort of a non-sponsor sponsor a sponsor who doesn't pay the money up front but is ultimately helping to sponsor the program exactly right most people don't know that's probably been done for years but now it's done a little it can go down to the smaller business years back you'd hear call this number and dial extension xxx mm -hmm. well that extension is what you're talking about that was specific to that show mm -hmm. and so when the the uh corporation whatever they were selling uh, would get that get that hit off that extension they know it came from you so now you can do it with walk in with this coupon or walk in and say, hey, I heard on the Boathouse radio show. And now the smaller business person can take advantage of that. They don't have to have the big phone banks and the operators dialing and they can do it locally right at the cash register. Right. And if you're willing to give up a few percentage points of the affiliate program 
and give it to the customer in the form of a discount, now everybody's benefiting. You can save, if you go to this software package and you pay this web host, you get 10% off. Correct. All you have to do is use the name Mark, M-A-R-K, and you get 10% off, but in fact that company's giving me 25%. Yeah, you're so, driving it direct to them, and that that's the way it, the Internet's evolving. Mm -hmm. it, it's making it easier, and it's making it more, uh, you're connecting more of your audience as well, too. Because then, you know, if you have a good show, as you know, the people feel like they know you. You walk out on the street, and they come up, and they're, they're, they're like your good buddy. Yeah, I've seen you, I've heard you, I know you. I was going through the uh, TSA one time, and... The guy looking at the monitor of my bag went through, and he goes, oh, Mike, I listened to your show. I love you. Right be That's when I was on the Angels radio station. He goes, uh, you're right before the Angels precast, and so we always dial it and listen to you, and we're led right into the Angels games. And I was at the airport. At least I didn't get, uh, you know, I, I had nothing on me. I went through the x-ray, okay, but that's another story. I'll tell you one time that, about that. But uh, uh, there's ways to connect with your advertisers, with your sponsors, with local businesses, that's why I think podcasts are great, especially if they have a local flair, because now you can offer it to the dry cleaner, to the restaurant, to the hardware store that's local and helps that community. And so it really builds a following. Right. Or a nationally based program. Or a nationally based. You know, your boating uh, show, which hopefully we're going to see here one day soon, where you can actually tap into national retailers and other major establishments. Absolutely. And you can go to them in a number of different ways, whether it's money up front or it's, it's money on the back end, but one way or another, you're able to pull pull off some magic. Yeah, exactly, and when we, when we talk the national level, um, it makes it really nice because the national advertisers are used to this. So when you talk to them, it's, it's not like you're talking to someone local who's going, you're doing what? The national advertisers go, oh, you wanna do affiliate? Oh, you need us to sponsor this special event you're doing? Oh, you wanna have some trinkets to give out because you're going out and setting up somewhere? They'll draw people to your booth and draw people to you. So there's a lot. When you go national, there's a lot more you can do to enhance everything. Yeah. You don't have to educate the local businesses as well as to what's possible. Right. The big businesses already know what they're, what they're doing. Right. Correct. And so let's apply this lesson to something that's more current, more accessible, which is this podcast world. Um, the lessons in radio have largely been lost. The people, because it, you didn't have to go door to, you don't have to go door to door when people sell you a right. box. They sell right. you the Rode Podcaster. Amazing piece of gear, by the way. No yes, affiliate program <laughs> yet, but hopefully Rode, if you're listening. The Rode Podcaster. <laughs> Kick ass podcasting. Lots of features. We love it. And, uh, but you, you, you can set that up in your living room and think you're doing the whole job. But in fact, that is such a small piece of the puzzle. And these lessons from radio, they, they really, they don't, people don't talk about them as much. The idea of someone walking in and saying, oh, I don't have sponsors yet, but I'm working on it, it means that you're not doing the stuff that would generally have been required in order to make, make something magnificently successful. I don't have sponsors yet because I don't have a million people listening is this unbelievable catch-22 that you'll never overcome. You're never going to get a million people to, to listen to you without the sponsors and you're not going to have sponsors without the million people. So the solution has to be more door to door. It has to be that grinding fight to build the entire business, right? Exactly. And, and you're mentioning sitting down on the couch and, and uh, kicking out a show. Some people are doing it and they're getting away with it, but typically when you get that, you get a lower quality, not to do the road podcaster, which we all love. And, I'll second you on that. Uh, I've used it. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's a great piece. It's a great piece of equipment. You know, and and people say, "Oh, I can get look. <laughs> I, I can buy this podcasting kit for two thousand dollars, and my show will be all over the world." Well, it, like we're talking about, you've got to build the business. You've got to get back to the basics. And coming off the radio side really helps because you understand that the quality of not only the product, which is your show, has to be top notch. But you've got to have all your ducks in a row. And so 
by doing that, by going out the businesses and telling them what you're doing, what you're, what you can expose them to, how you can help them, and they can help you, is how you can build that business and be upfront with them. That's one reason I really like advertising separate from content, because we would always make sure. Be, I would always make sure before I actually voiced over a commercial, I made sure that commercial was legit. That product is legit. I didn't want to voice over something to put my name on it. If it didn't, because then I'm an, I'm an, I'm lying to my my listeners, my audience, and that would not they would get caught on. You got to be yourself, yep. and you've got to be honest, and you've got to be upfront. And if you follow those principles, I think, and that's what the big shows do, you'll be good. At least you can sleep at night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can sleep at night. So it's a, it is a lot of work, but it's but it's a lot of fun when it pays off. It, it, it's a lot of fun, and the great thing about these sponsors. Is, is that in many circumstances, it doesn't feel as much like a business deal. It feels like a partnership. Well, it's interesting because for years and years and years, I went to, to what is still going called the Talkers Convention back in New York. And the Talkers is put on by Talkers Magazine and all the big shows come there, all the big uh, producers, the, the, the people are out there promoting the shows. And I'd, I would go around and just ask them, how are you doing that? This is something the law, the the local startup shows forgot. They think they can just watch them on TV or listen to, you know, Handy on the radio and go, oh, I can do that. But how does he do it? So I would talk to him about, well, how do you time the show? What's your clock like? Where do you set in your specific advertisers? How do you arrange your advertisers? What are you charging them? What do they get for their for their money? What's the back end of it? And that really helped, and that made it very worthwhile to go to this. And especially when you're talking to people in the business, especially mm -hmm. people in the business for 30, 40 years, they were there on radio started some of these guys, I swear. They're, they're, they're <laughs> <laughs> they, they were the beginners of it. And um, unfortunately, we're losing some of those people now. And we're we losing are. that knowledge and that history. But I, I would sit down and just talk. I didn't want to, I didn't ask them for anything. Hey, will you sponsor my show? Hey, have you get me out? No, I asked them, how are you doing this? How did you start? What do you see the trend going to? And for years it was AM's going away, AM's going away. It's all going FM, radio's dead. But now AM's one of the biggest advertising markets in the world. Mm -hmm. It it's huge. It's not going anywhere. It's staying there. And podcast, what was really scary is is the the radio industry was scared that the internet and the podcast were going to suck and feed out of their advertising base. Well, what's happening now, the two are working together. And they're working together very well. But you just don't take a show and just throw it to a podcast. Right. I mean, you can. You take the show and you edit it to the podcast. Yeah. And then don't have dead air, number one. <laughs> Yeah, everything, and that's that's part of this sort of bundle of uh, of powers concept, which is that that every piece of content can continue to direct people like a like a funnel into the revenue channels, and that the subscriber base it doesn't matter where they're coming from, where the eyeballs are sitting, or the or the eardrums are sitting, that that it becomes this force. And you're seeing this in the aggregation of a lot of technology, a lot of en entertainment, where you know it's the more licenses you own or something like that. But obviously, if you're able to build an audience and you're splitting them across numerous platforms, that's okay. If you're not, you know, if you're getting the synergies out of this, if you don't have to spend three times the money for three platforms, if you could spend two times the money, or even one and a half times the money for three platforms, it can be miraculously worth it. Exactly right, and that's where it all comes together. Your back-end business has to include that concept. How can I expand the show? How can I get more outlets, whether it be podcasting, radio, TV, print media, very important still, yep. everybody forgets it. You wanna get, it, get into print media, what I mean by that is, have a columnist write about you. Have a feature uh, writer put an article in about your show. It can be local, it can be national, but all that ties together. And that's one thing I had the advantage of is I had a lot of those pieces working together for me when I had the radio show. Mm -hmm. So to do that with a podcast is very smart. Yeah, well, the podcast naturally does it, and, and you're, you're skipping over the magical word. You, you've, 
you've 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 danced around the word syndication, but you've not actually right. said the right. word syndication. Scary but that's, word. It's a scary word, and it's a complicated business yes. in terms of who's paying for the license or whether you're paying for additional markets. But the leverage of the fact that you're creating the content once and utilizing it yes. a thousand times is once again phenomenal. It, it, you know, it, it didn't it didn't happen in the beginning of this, and the people who figured this out. Uh, the Julia Childs of the world and others yes. that figured out that you could put one show on multiple platforms. I, I kind of alluded to it at the start when I was talking about radio about being able to buy time slot in different markets. Yeah, there's two ways to do syndication that that I've utilized. One is you have a good show; it's a national show, so you have the San Diego market. Well, you know, Phoenix has a huge boater. A base out there huge people don't know that so I'll pick up the Phoenix station saying I'll see how much they'll charge me I'll get advertisers out there maybe some nationals will come in get some local spots as well now I do my one show and I've split the feed like you're talking about or you can go to a syndicating company to where they go out and negotiate all the syndication mm -hmm. for you and package it up for you depending where the state that in that case you may have some stations that that uh, you pay for, you're buying the time slot. You may have some smaller stations or some states really love your show and they'll give you the time slot, providing you give them some commercial time, some commercial space to call the veils and in the show. And so there's different ways you can negotiate, but syndicating companies uh, uh, can be scary and be careful because some shows, they lose it when they syndicate. They can't control it. They can't keep the base going. And so if you're going to syndicate, do it slowly, branch out. Yeah. And do it smartly. Smartly. It, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, yes. it's tough to have, let's say, two people running your advertising and yes. then all of a sudden find that you've created four times yes. the market and you still have the same two people doing the advertising. I'm here and I've got to Florida and sell it. That's right. And, and now you're – that's it. That's – the job is bigger. It's not four times bigger necessarily. But it's definitely bigger. Yeah, and, and there's, there's another thing people forget, ego. All of a sudden, you, it's like, you mean I can get on six stations? Well, wait, wait, can you control six stations? Yeah. So maybe you want to go to two and get that worked out and then go to three. Unless you're with a, a, a radio conglomerate, then they may just take and bump you out through different you know, outlets that they have. And that's fine. Providing on, on the cost-benefit ratio you have uh, worked out with them. But if you're jumping to independent stations or, or you're, you're even jumping different uh, owners, per se, on the stations, then that's where you got to be a little careful. Yeah. Now, there's sort of a built-in syndication model in podcasting if you pick the right guests. Yes. Because the guests themselves have their own channels, their own programming, their own ability to market, and everybody's looking for content. And if I'm promoting you and you have your own channel, in all likelihood, you're not only going to promote our episode, but you might start promoting me. And so we have this ability to almost share our personalities. Yes. And that's very important. Now, what I, the reason the radio stations would put shows, pick shows uh, behind me and in front of me is because I would come on their show before my show started, and, and I would talk about what they're talking, and then we would lead into my show. So there's a nice transition there at, at the top of the hour. And then the same thing would happen going into the show that usually followed me. And that was usually maybe a new show starting out or, or someone established. But then I would bring them on at the very last, say, 60 seconds of my show and lead into their show. Hey, what are you bringing up today, Mark? Let's, mm -hmm. let's hear it. You've got some exciting stuff going on. You know, hey, how's yeah. those angels doing? <laughs> right, cross-selling the audience. And that, that works out very well. So podcasts can do the same thing. Bring someone into a podcast. Now on their podcast, they're going to talk about being on my podcast or your podcast. Right. And there you go. You're cross-selling. That's right. And make it part of the deal. Start, you know, don't assume. Get those guests talking about you. Pick the right guests. Yes. And work out the deals up front. And because uh, everybody can scratch each other's back. Yes, absolutely. Now, you'd, of course, in this industry, as you know, we got some good actors and some bad actors. No pun intended. But uh, our radio hosts and bad radio hosts or bad podcasters, whatever. So you want to make sure the show that you are leading into is a viable show. Not that not 
to, to say viable as it's making money in the you want to make sure that it's it's not a scam and there are some out there so you mm -hmm. do have to be you do have to do your homework right and that's really important because you don't want to be tied up with someone who now like say a financial show and now all of a sudden they're getting indicted for a financial scam which is very common in the industry so you just want to do your homework make sure it's a reputable show work with them yeah work with them so uh we're about out of time i am hopeful that i'll get you back here as we start to build the brand new Boathouse TV network where we're going to be providing incredible boating advice and things like that. And so you're doing this all over again. Let's go. It's time. There is a, right now, a, a boating is still a very, very hot market. Boating and fishing is the number one way in the United States families spend time together over any other activity, whether it's going to watch a football game or going to a soccer practice, it's boating and fishing. So. It, Boats are still selling very well. The biggest boat market, as you know, is 26 uh, foot or less is your huge market. Then you have your, your boats that climb up to mega yachts and super mega yachts that everyone likes to see on TV and take tours of. But I, I feel there's a void right now out in the market of boater education coming through a show, uh, helping people such as uh, how do I bottom paint my boat? How do I go to a shipyard? I want to travel up and down the coast. How do I go to a marina? What marinas are there? And I feel with that education and working with other boaters in the industry, such as Boating and Waterways of California, uh, some of the towing companies across the US, we could really help not only have a, a fun show, but also an educational show, have a little uh, uh, stuff there people can utilize when they actually go on the water. And some people just want to live, they want to be an armchair boater. They just want to sit back and listen. They don't even want to get on the water, but they just enjoy the show. Yeah. Well, you know where my heart is as an author in this field as well, yes. in, the, in the liveaboard space. I, I couldn't be more excited uh, to do this. So it, we, it'll be we're going to have a lot to talk about. As fellow boating authors, I think this is going to be great. We're going to be combining our, our skills and knowledges. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you for coming out and joining. Um, thank you, Mark. Yeah, Let me go back behind. So uh, once again, this is the studio life, and this is just amazing studio stuff. Uh, I mean, this is the core, which is that what we produce is not done. It, it's not done before we produce it. It's not done after we produce it. It's really a whole package. It starts with this concept, and it ends up going door to door and figuring out how we're going to turn things into something. Uh, this has been a pleasure uh, to host my good friend, Mike, and I hope you join us again soon. All I right. I forgot to thank Nick. I also forgot Hi. to say, I also <laughs> forgot to say sponsors and subscribe <laughs> and everything else. Voiceover. <laughs> Three.